probably many times since we were pretty little. But what does playing by heart really mean? Playing by heart is not just memorizing the music. We've all heard memorized performances that are just mechanical, that don't really make sense musically and don't really move us. Playing by heart occurs when we know the music so well that all of our attention can be paid to the musicality of the piece, the tone, the expression. Memorization is not the end goal. Memorization is part of playing by heart. As we know, some people are better mem at memorizing than other people, which leads us to the question, are some people born better memorizers? The answer to this is no. We all have the capacity to memorize, but our ability to memorize depends on our training. Um, I'd like to read for you today a story from Dr. Suzuki's book, Nurtured by Love. In this story, he's talking about two of his students that he's trained since the time they were very small, probably three years old. And in the, at the time of this story, they're about 15. Says so Suzuki, what is talent, ability? It does not exist at birth, but it has to be created. One day, a request came from the Matsumoto Broadcasting Station for a radio performance. I thought, this is a good opportunity, and I wanted the two boys to play the Vivaldi concerto for two violins. They had never played it before. I decided to test the two boys to see how much they could remember. I gave the Broadcasting Station the name of the music, but did not tell Koji and Kenji until the morning of the preceding day. I called them from their room and gave them the music, telling them, this music has to be played tomorrow at 1 p.m. on a radio broadcast. It is rather sudden, but it will be a good exercise for you. You'd better start practicing right away. Both were surprised, saying, this is awful, and so on, but they took their respective music books and went joyfully to the room. In a few moments, I heard the turn tune of the concerto for two violins. I left the two practicing and went on an errand. When we all met at supper time, I asked, well, can you manage it? Can you manage it? Well, sir, they said, you certainly startled us today. It's lovely music, though, isn't it? Although they accused me of pulling a fast one on them, they seemed to enjoy it, and there was no sign of anxiety or, or uneasiness. Before they went to the broadcasting station the next day, I wanted to hear their performance. Both handed over their music books, which I took and put on the table, and then I listened to their playing. It has always been our custom for the children to give the music books to the teacher before playing. After the two had finished, I said, you played very well. Your tone and musical interpretation are indeed fine. Now play there just as well. I will listen here. They went out to the waiting car in high spirits. They had left the music books, of course, on the table. As I point out later in this book, I put great store on memory training. My students must know the music by heart and not refer to their written notes. Both these boys have been taught like this from childhood. It didn't even occur to them to take the music along. Therefore, if we really value memorization as an important part of our students' <laughs> musical training, we have to make it part of their instruction from the very beginning. This way it becomes a natural part of learning music for them, and not a scary aspect that's added later on. Um, now, as I've said, our ability to memorize depends on our training, but we were not all trained this way. However, we all still have the capacity to memorize. Raise your hand if you can remember your locker combination. Now raise your hand if you have your locker combination written on the bottom of your shoe. No? We're all past that? We've all memorized it, right? So we all do have the capacity to memorize. Unfortunately, memorizing music is a little bit harder than just memorizing our locker combination. We have to remember millions of actions all at once, at very rapid speed, and exactly in the right sequence. A study was once done to see how many um, operations a violinist had to remember during a piece they were playing. The result of this study was a staggering 3,550 operations per minute. That's how many they had to remember, how many separate things. Now that's a lot, but the good news is that we already naturally remember an awful lot of these. For example, this note, trouble bluff. <laughs> you have to think about whether this is a high two or a low two every time we see it in a piece. When we were seven, did we have to think about that? But since then, we've memorized this piece of information. Our brain knows this very securely. We're not going to forget this. How about this rhythm pattern? Every time we see this in a piece of music, do we have to stop and clap it out? Or do we just remember how it goes? We've seen this enough that it's very familiar to us and we recognize it. Um, how about this passage music? If a violinist sees this in the orchestra music, are they going to sit there and look at every single note as they play? No. Each one of those passages is a scale, and they can tell that they're in ascending and descending sequences. Knowing, that, um, knowing these building blocks, such as scales and sequences, helps the violinist to be able to 
Sight with this piece or memorize it much easier. Which raises us to the building blocks of memory. The more of these tools that we have, such as skills, sequences, ability to recognize movement patterns, the easier we will be able to memorize a piece of music. Um, similarly, similarly, the more music that we memorize, the more material we have to draw upon, the more things we already have stored in our memories. So how does the brain remember information? The most popular theory in this regard is called the chunk theory. And this theory implies that the brain breaks information into smaller, more familiar groups so that we can remember it more easily. Uh, for example, this number. That's a pretty big number, right? Would it be hard to memorize? But would this be easier? Right, because we've broken it into small groups that are familiar to us. A telephone number. We can all remember our telephone numbers. Um, one of the big things, though, about the chunk theory is that these groups have to make sense to us, or else it won't help us remember them. For example, if an expert chess player looks at his chessboard, he sees the pieces in familiar groups that relate to his strategy. But if he mix all these pieces up, he won't be able to remember them any better than any of us could, because they no longer make sense to him. Uh, similarly with music, these groups, that have, these groups have to make sense to us in order for us to be able to easily remember them. Um, and this is why it's easier to remember music that has constructions that we're familiar with, or um, is clearly broken into sections. Sometimes with more modern atonal music, it's harder to remember because we're not as quite as familiar with those elements. Um, four types of memory. Who can tell me one of the types of memory? Anyone? Medium, short term memory. That's true. What about? I'll, I'll tell you one. Oral memory. Um, Knowing it with your ears. What's another type? Tactile, yes. Kinesthetic or tactile memory. What's another one? Katie? Visual. Visual memory. And what's the fourth one? Does anyone know? Does it have to do with like, talking or anything? Not quite. You can smell. We have oral memory, hearing with our ears, visual, seeing, kinesthetic or muscle memory, and then our conscious or analytical memory. Now this last one is not always included. People don't always remember it. But it's really important because the more you analyze a piece of music, the more you know theoretically how it goes, the better understanding you have of the piece as a whole, and the better understanding, the better you'd be able to keep playing the piece should the other three types of memory go. So it's important to have all four types of memory for the most secure performance. Which brings us to the steps for memorizing music. Our first step is to get a basic overview of the piece, and this is where a lot of that analytical memory comes in. It's important to listen to the piece, to get an oral sense of how it goes, and to analyze it for form, structure, key changes, anything. When you're doing this, you're creating your map of the piece. And the more detailed your map is, the more likely, the less likely you are to get lost while you're playing it. Um, and here we have an example of a map that a piano student created for a piece that they were playing. Your map can be anything that helps you. Your map should be something that makes sense to you, it's something that helps you get a sense of how the piece fits together as a whole. Um, so we had our first step, which is we had a basic overview of the piece. Our next step is to learn the piece with the music. Once you can play the piece with the music, accurately at a steady tempo, you can start memorizing it. You don't have to be able to play the entire piece accurately at a steady tempo to be ready to start memorizing. Once you can play just one section, you can start memorizing that section while you're learning the rest of the piece. This way you have more time to get more familiar with the music um, and be more secure in your memory. It's important to learn pieces in manageable sections, like we said with the chunk theory. It's easier for our brain to remember smaller sections of information rather than just a big jumbled mess. Um, and while we're playing these sections, we have to be careful to always combine the new material with the old material. For example, if we're building a Lego castle and we just stack all the blocks, but we don't actually squish them together to hook them together, the cat can easily come and knock down our castle. But we don't want the cat to move and knock down our performance. So we have to combine our new sections with our old sections so that we really know how the piece fits together as a whole. It's not memorized until it's been reintegrated back into the whole piece. So some helpful hints for memorizing music. We have to make sure we build memorization time into our daily practice time. Memory is like any skill. You have to practice it in order to get better at it. Um, you only want to memorize the amount that your brain can handle each day. Start as small as you need to. Even if it's just one measure of the piece, if you memorize one measure every day, you'll eventually know the whole piece. And the good thing about memory is the more you practice,
practice it, the easier it will become for you. So if you could only memorize one measure a day when you started, maybe a month later you'd be able to memorize a whole section at a time. Um, it's important, important also to be in a good mental state that's conducive for memorizing and focusing on music when you're working on memory. Um, if we try to memorize while we're tired, hungry, or otherwise distracted, it's going to be harder to focus on what we're doing. If our brain is foggy while we're memorizing, mental image we're creating is also going to be foggy. Raise your hand if you know how the game of telephone works. Alright, let, let's remind ourselves how that works. <laughs> Uh, another thing that will increase your security is being able to start from anywhere in the piece. 
So, Victoria, do you want to come Can you, do you want to help me with this 
for? You don't have to play. So what would you like me to do? I'm going to have you look at this piece of music. And in my music, I've marked numbers. And each of these numbers, I should be able to start from. So I'm going to play. Sometime in this phrase here, you're going to clap. When Katie claps, that's going to simulate a memory slip. When I hear the clap, I have to go immediately to the next point in music. <laughs> oh, you can put that down too. On the stands. Okay. Did you come up with these strategies yourself, or was it research-based? 